So this is my talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, influences in the context of game and cultural criticism. So a slightly different format, but you get the idea. Um, so there's a tendency that I keep sensing popping its head up in indie games uh, to get really hung up on novelty for novelty's sake. I call this the boy genius syndrome. Um, it's kind of about being the first to colonize a new idea space in the digital world. Um, but it's not just an indie game thing, it's an extension of larger cultural values. In this case, like tech culture specifically, um, it's in a way about re willingly reducing your ideas down to one like easily sellable hook. I think this works particularly well because in the game space, the standards are still pretty collectively low as far as interesting or unconventional approaches go towards making games. Um, there are interesting and unconventional games that are popping up, but it's a very new sort of culture. Um, but anything that kind of stands out from that gets amplified um, by those participating on the more progressive end of that sphere as this great new thing, but only as long as it's kind of easy to communicate about what it's about and sell that idea in some form. Maybe not so surprisingly, this tends to mean a harder path for a lot of games that are aiming for a more nuanced or hard to interpret Hard, or hard to convey or hard to sell kind of experiences. Um, this expression and these fights that people in the game community are engaging in every day um, against a dominant culture that is pretty much defined by intense conservatism um, gets seen as like a novelty, almost a sideshow. Work is made to embody one idea only. So our expression is always being reframed by outside cultural forces that are trying to make sense of our work and put it into some sort of understandable, easy to talk about category. Um, these categories are defined by cultural norms, which in this case, like the norm of video games, which is still, in a way, this is like from an old Nintendo Power ad, um, but this is essentially where we're still at with video games. Um, and, you know, companies like Nintendo have manufactured and heavily pushed this idea of gamer and game culture and what that means, and done actively entrenched uh, them as an active way of entrenching themselves in the market, which effectively has erased a lot of what are considered anomalies of the past. Like, people have been doing art experiments with games since the beginning, since the early 80s. Um, and, um, you know, also physical games, like we forget about, you know, how much work has been done in that sphere before digital games exist. Um, in the larger game culture sphere, what we see is, you know, what people think of as Nintendo and consoles and, and, and this history that has been manufactured by these companies. Um, so I'm going to talk about movie Videodrome. Um, in the movie Videodrome, a corporation that makes eyeglasses, which is actually a front for a company that manufactures weapons for NATO, by the way. This is immense spoilers on the entire movie, sorry. Um, they create a weapon which takes the form of a video of extreme BDSM porn, um, and it's dubbed Videodrome. And that extreme, that extreme sexualized violence that's depicted in it causes these deep bodily effects on the person that it's exposed to. Um, in this case, a tumor in the brain, and literally you die after you see it after, at a certain point. But it also causes these heavy delusions, delusions and hallucinations, and it kind of rewires your body by forcing it quite literally to take out their own will, the will of the people who have made this weapon. Um, the subject in the film they expose it to, under the guise of a pirate transmission, is a uh, guy, Max Wren, who's played by James Woods, who is here putting his head in a TV um, that's giant lips. Um, uh, and he's the owner of like a CD sex TV channel, um, who the corporation is specifically targeting him to get him to show it on his network to, because they want to broadcast it to the kind of people who watch, you know, CD porn um, and expose them and, you know, get them to do their bidding, essentially. Uh, towards the end of the movie, when Max finds out that he has been exposed to bit Videodrome, he is tasked um, by Barry Convex, who is the name of the... I love the names in this movie, it's the, the best names. Um, this is kind of a terrifying image. It's a, 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 a hand with a gun coming out of a TV that is made of a flesh wall. 
There are really amazing special effects in this movie. Anyway, um, towards the end of the movie, um, Max is tasked with um, taking out the daughter, um, who's Bianca Oblivion, of this research, uh, academic researcher whose name is Brian Oblivion. Um, and he is sort of fought to create this counterattack to Videodrome before he succumbs to it, like the tumor that he got from it. His counterattack was kind of to embrace the form of videos and reframe it as a new extension of our own flesh and use that as a weapon against, you know, these interests that are trying to, you know, use it as a weapon um, and a way of controlling people. Um, and also as a way of communicating the dangers of Videodrome. Um, Max, so Max tries to kill Bianca, his daughter, but she understands how Videodrome works and has manages to catch him and sort of reprogram him. And she makes him repeat, repeat this phrase, I am the video word made flesh, death to Videodrome, long live the new flesh. I, I think the new flesh is another way of looking at digital devices as an extension of our bodies or as a way of being, and embracing them as parts of us, as something that we exercise full autonomy over, instead of letting them fall under the spell of this corporate ideology or the military-industrial complex. Um, and this is something that right now that's an intense battleground, not just um, in video games, but technology in general. Um, the internet is an intense ideological battleground right now. Um, and I mean, like, I don't know, the, the way... Hmm. The, the way that this movie contextualizes the past two months, um, the way that it portrays this extreme violence in the form of Videodrome is directly analogous to me to a hyper-violent FPS because that violence is what exposes you to, um, in, in a sort of a deep bodily way, um, that makes it kind of a more powerful current for ideological like indoctrination. Um, and a way to employ kind of these smaller time subjects, these people who are disillusioned, into carrying out acts of violence, both rhetorical and literal, against people who might represent the counter contingent against these ideologies, which um, in this case, with games, is women. <laughs> um, I don't really think we understand how powerful video games are. I think the military does. The military and the arms manufacturers' relationship with the AAA industry has been increasingly documented. Um, I think, you know, like Facebook buying out Oculus Rift, like they understand that that technology has power and they want to be able to control it to some extent. Um, the problem with all of this, like understanding all of this, is that we're often bad at envisioning and embracing this new flesh as a tool of progress um, in this ideological battleground of the internet. Um, in his movie, The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, uh, Slavo Žižek looks at the many apocalypse scenarios that are increasingly saturating popular media, like zombie stories, the biggest example. And, and he asks, why is it so much easier for us to envision in the popular cultural consciousness consciousness a total apocalyptic collapse of society than it is for us to imagine a fairly minor shift in the, our ways of understanding and constructing the reality of our situation. Um, and I think the answer is that it's the logical endpoint of the ideological path that we've been put on now is total either acceptance or total destruction. There is something, and there is something intensely painful in the midst of this about realizing that we have autonomy over our bodies, and by extension, the, the objects that we use, and our, we have the ability to make a shift in understanding and construction of that reality. Um, it's a struggle, and it involves experiencing pain. Now, the other thing I wanted to say about pain is like, I used to hate The Shining. Like, I saw that movie, and like, I didn't really understand it. Like, I thought it was scary, but I just, it seemed really cold and alien and like manipulative and almost cheap to me, and I just didn't like it. It felt like it was intentionally making me feel upset like or used in not like a particularly nuanced way. It was just really painful for me to watch it. Um, then, like, several years later, I read some analysis and I started to see that there was a voice in that, in the inside of that movie, and the things that I observed when I had first seen it 
which I had assumed were misreadings or things that I didn't understand that kind of went against the surface narrative of the film were actually totally correct readings um, in, in their own way. Like Jack, the father, uh, played by Jack Nicholson, is never ever ever meant to be anything less than terrifying from the beginning of the film, which is totally different from the book. Um, and the, and I, this is very intentional. The movie is kind of a critique of the nuclear family structure and also like the kind of idea of white male imperialism, but it does this in this very abstracted way um, that it only becomes apparent kind of through the images and through the interaction of things um, than any of the surface events of the story. Um, and I think I understood this at some intuitive level, but it, it, I had to experience that kind of pain to be able to get to that, to understand it. Um, and I think that puts it um, in the context of like his larger body of work, which is also just about providing commentary on these sorts of large issues and how they intersect, and like trying to you know provide some sort of intelligent perspective on them, but in a very kind of subtle psychological way. Um, I think game culture is increasingly built around never allowing people to feel serious pain for more than like the shortest period of time. Um, and I don't mean pain like getting hit, your character getting hit in the game or something like that, or there being blood splattering everywhere or whatever. I mean pain to you, like the player, through design ideas which might challenge your assumptions um, or challenge your patience. There's a lot of like, kind of, um, I, there's an idea that these things are kind of being streamlined out of games and they're not desirable, or they're only desirable in very short bursts. Um, I, I think often people approach games as some sort of sacred space that's defined by this escape from ideology, um, but in doing this we actively ignore how strongly ideological that experience is, like that experience of enjoyment or escape. Everything has an ideology to it. The problem is like, you know, how, how it intersects and how it's interacting with you as a player. Um, so like, with The Shining, while many other mo movies kind of flatten and flop on the ground when you look at them in further analysis, things like Videodrome or The Shining continue to just kind of unfold and have, be this like infinitely layered flower where they, they just keep coming up again and again and applying to like a situation that is divorced like 30 years on from both of these films which are like both from like 19, early 80s. Um, uh, um, yeah, and I think that there's, um, the, the thing that's really unique about movies like this is they embrace their form, they embrace the plasticity of it. They, they love the, the images and the construction and the, the detail and the shot composition. They know that these experiences are transparently not real in the like pure factual sense or like cinema verite sense, wh whatever that means. And therefore, it makes them much more real in, in, in another way that applies to like a deeper kind of reality. They embrace this like fabricated world as a channel into something deeper, or they embrace the technology, they embrace the new flesh. <laughs> um, and another artist who I just want to mention does this. This is uh, a shot from David Lynch's movie, Inland Empire, and it's the simplest shot. It's a red lamp, but you see that image of lamps and the color red continually throughout his movies, and they have these deep symbolic meanings, but they're abstracted in such a way that it would be very difficult to understand exactly what they mean, but you understand through the sequence of events and, like, you know, the relation, the, the way that characters interact with these objects, that there is something there. And I think that is uniquely suited to games like abstraction and the ways, and ways of kind of reconstructing our reality that is a new sort of attack against this like default ideology that we see. Um, so I think we need to jump out of that realm of the, the boy genius and being clever for cleverness sake and into one of being magicians and artists and um, because the end point of that first approach is being co-opted and re-entrenched back into the culture whereas the end result of this approach is we gain a better understanding a more a better and a more empathetic understanding of what our life is and how to respond to it how to be human in the face of all these just vast architectures that are kind of controlling our interactions and the way that we see ourselves but anyway that's my talk <laughs>